uh, a kid in the school, and we had uh, we had a field trip uh, to go to the, the the most interesting and largest uh, art museum in Moscow called the Tretyakov Gallery, and uh, there is uh, a whole section that is dedicated to called ancient Russian art, which of course is Byzantine iconography, and. Uh, uh, there, I remember uh, seeing for the first time um, this icon of Christ, and I could not uh, take my eyes off it. I didn't understand anything about it, since uh, Christianity was a banned subject. I really didn't know who is that person depicted in this uh, amazing image, but I was struck to the core by, by its life. By, by its presence. And uh, we're going out with my future wife. We, we visited ruined churches because they were places of kind of a, uh, that held this wonderful attraction for us. They were places of, of, of mystery and uh, uh, a certain value in life that, that, that uh, we could not find in the, anywhere else. So we came to the United States and met our teacher who is a single most important influence uh, in our life, Father Alexander Schwemann, uh, who sort of took us in in some way and uh, uh, received my wife and baptized me and, and, um, and I want to be very much like him. I want to be with him somehow and, and that's why uh, my theological studies ended up in ordination and becoming, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, becoming a priest like my teacher. In the fear of God and with faith and love, draw near. challenge because uh, this is a contemporary saint uh, that uh, of the early 20th century and uh, there are a number of photographs uh, available so you have to try to make the face recognizable it's not a true portrait uh, in, in the normal sense so those are just the panels they have to be gessoed uh, which I almost almost finished and then they have to be sent it down uh, uh, so that will be very smooth in order to uh, take the paint. And so in these two panels are going to be uh, two main icons in the little church, a uh, little mission church in Macomb, uh, Mississippi. So they've been waiting for a while, so that's what I, I need to work on. So I've been working for, for this, this parish, Holy Resurrection Church in Mississippi, in Clinton, Mississippi, for a while. And uh, they um, uh, had uh, a family in the parish that just recently suffered a tragedy. There was a young man uh, who, um, together with his father, they were both avid fishermen. And unfortunately, one time they went fishing and uh, uh, the young man, I think he was about 22, 23, uh, uh, just killed over and fell, fell down and died. He had an aneurysm, uh, of which they, they, they weren't aware of. And so the family, you know, in uh, memory of this young man, 
uh, but I uh, decided to donate the first mural. And so we thought that a very appropriate theme uh, would be the appearance of Christ at the Sea of Galilee. And that's the, that's the theme for the mural. It's really the very large piece. I, I've never done anything as large as that. I think it's uh, you know, 12 foot wide and then 8, eight feet uh, uh, high. So, and since I cannot work on site, uh, it, uh, it has to be done on canvas. And then, uh, after everything is done, uh, it will be then laminated on the wall like, uh, like wallpaper, basically, hung on the wall. So you begin, actually, with work, with, with work that was done before you. So you try to find images. Uh, you find the iconographic compositions that are similar to what you're, you need to do. And you look at them, you absorb them, you find the ones that, that composition-wise, something close that you want to do. Uh, you, uh, especially with such a large image, uh, uh, it would have taken a long time to sketch it out on that scale. So normally I have, I have a couple of models that I project and I see how things are on such a large scale and then I sketch them uh, uh, from the projection. And then I begin to work with the drawing, uh, kind of again developing, developing the image in that stage. I uh, I just use um, uh, watercolor pencils. I love to draw so much that that I normally make drawings more, more complex, almost uh, kind of as complete as I possibly can. Gold leaf is it's a real gold, 23 carat, but it's beaten so thin that you can't even breathe out of it because it'll crumble. Ah, what are you doing? Terrible builder, because I waste the difference between the a professional builder and an amateur. So is that the professional never wastes. <laughs> yes. But I waste a lot. It still comes out right in the end. it. Oh, the building is done. Mm. Okay. <laughs> there aren't very many, very many uh, different colors, so they, but they have to be very transparent. So it, it's, it's going to be fun. Once you start working on something large as that, uh, uh, you love it. Because you can fit so much. And you can work more expressively. Which I think is uh, something that I cherish a lot. When you start really drawing, uh, uh, then 
it's just a matter of keeping the whole thing in your mind. And uh, so that, that's why uh, with something that big is uh, hard because I have to climb up on the scaffolds, then climb down, step back, look at the then come. <laughs> but you keep it in mind. I mean, you remember, uh, you sort of, once, once the, the whole composition is settled, then, then you can work on a smaller piece, let's say on a group of the apostles in the boat. And they are pretty much, uh, so you can come close. But especially with faces, you have to step back. And then when you step back, of course, the, you know, you're able to get the whole image uh, in one glance. Uh, and that's what you have when you work on a smaller piece. But then, as I said, the, the wonderful thing about it is that uh, you can, uh, there's so uh, uh, much more space uh, for, for details, for, for expression. Uh, it's a matter, a matter of being in that space. When it's this way, it's very easy, actually, because it's just about your scale, your inside. But if it's, if it's much smaller, so you feel uh, your bones creak when you, when you try to squeeze yourself inside there. It's a, it's a different feeling. But it, uh, uh, I guess, I guess I, I, uh, over the years I've done this shifts uh, often enough uh, not to be tremendously bothered by them. The hardest thing here would be, would be actually the water, to make it so it will be transparent and alive and yet rich of color. Very often, uh, you uh, in the icons you see that they either do it absolutely uh, flat, and basically you try to make a rich feel, very transparent. That's uh, that's okay. Sometimes you go and uh, and make the forms, the stylized waves, very solid, and that's that's uh, kind of a uh, a long thing. So in my case, I have to do both. Hello? Come on, talk. Hello? No, you need to go to the school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Try not to inhale a lot of that stuff because it's detrimental to your health. And this is egg tempera. Uh, it's just egg yolk and water and a little vinegar. And I mix it with a dry pigment. rich color, actually too rich. Normally that color would be shrill, so I have to tone it down with green. This green is uh, uh, very powerful. 
pigmency, but a little bit, and it changes the tone. And that's all there is to it. And actually, it's safe and quite even even if the pigments sometimes pigments are toxic, uh, like uh, cadmiums are. Can uh, can be bad for you, of course. If you inhale, then the dry stuff is the only one that you can do. But once it's wet, it's all right, as long as you don't lick your brushes, and I don't. Okay. So here we are. Although one of my mentors, uh, one of my mentors was. Uh, known to lick his brushes. He lived until the ripe old age of 85. <laughs> so it didn't, uh, it did not kill him. The trouble with, with uh, him was that if you talk, told him, hey, you're licking your brushes, and he would deny that vehemently because he would be concentrating on, on the work and uh, especially on something really small with a small brush. And he would unconsciously do this. And, but he would deny it. He would say, no, of course not. see quite a lot of them here and here and the, the, the flesh on hands and body and faces. This is the prime color. So it's the first coat that is very transparent so that the drawing actually is showing through. Uh, and then uh, you uh, uh, put a little bit of shadows uh, and then you paint the highlights that, that give uh, the direction the movement. The light has to come up from the from the prime colors because they're all very transparent. It has to be filled with light, but it's it's a sort of chaotic. It moves every which way. And highlights, uh, uh, instead of trying to create a surface, let's say you could have, uh, if that would have been a realistic painting, uh, the artist would have been painting the glare of light off the surface of the water. Now, uh, the, in the icon, uh, there's no external uh, source of light, so the, uh, the movement uh, of, the, of, of light that comes from uh, inside the color field uh, is then organized by the highlights and given movement. Here it's very, very simple, so this kind of circular, turbulent movement of the water uh, presenting in this stylized highlights. But this is the painting. Uh, of the iconographic composition called the appearance of the risen Christ at the Sea of Tiberias. So uh, Peter uh, and uh, some of uh, the apostles went fishing and they could not, could not find any fish. And in the morning they uh, uh, were coming back rather tired and sweaty and distraught and uh, uh, empty handed and they saw Christ, they, they did not recognize him immediately, but they saw the figure uh, of someone standing on the seashore. And like he did before, once before, he said, well, he asked them whether they caught anything. And they said, no, we toiled all night, but we didn't catch anything. They said, why don't you throw your net on the other side of the boat? Which of course is, is when you really think about it, it's total nonsense, and you just can't. Uh, you can't catch anything when the light is up. Uh, that's it, so it's a, a night, night, nighttime fishing. <laughs> and, and then from one side of the boat to the other side of the boat is not a big distance. So if, if there is no, there's no fish on one side, how it can be on the other side? But they, they lowered the nets and they caught 153 fish, large fish. And there were so many and the net didn't break. And uh, uh, then, uh, John said to Peter, it is the Lord. And Peter jumped in the water and swam toward Christ. And, when, uh, and, and the rest of them came uh, uh, 
uh, back in the boat driving the, the net full of fish. And uh, I was standing there with a fish lying on a bed of coals and bread. And he said, come and dine. And, uh, and I knew that it was Christ. Uh, that very same old uh, master uh, told me, well, when you put the prime colors, the, the darker you go, the thinner should, uh, you should mix your paints. So I'm afraid if you, would, if you would see something like this, which is really <laughs> a little too dense uh, and, uh, and not transparent, you would say, oh, you have to wash it. You have to wash it off. Everything has to be transparent. I think that just uh, in comparison to the scale of the whole piece, this is, this is very little. <laughs> I think I'll leave it. But uh, of course, I'm not as strict. I remember uh, 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 walking about and then crawling through the ruined churches in and around Moscow as much as we could. And, uh, and there were many of those. Um, the church, uh, the Soviets kept the churches in repair only around so-called the Golden Circle, only around around the center of Moscow, in order to show uh, ignorant Americans <laughs> and other tourists that uh, the, uh, the Christianity or the church is very free in Soviet Union. <laughs> That's look at that, all those beautiful churches. But you walk away from it, really uh, less than a mile from that. Uh, uh, from the center of town, and, and you see skeletons of the cupolas and the churches, uh, church buildings converted to uh, storage or public lavatories and uh, uh, all kinds of other, other, other uses. So, and sometimes it's just simply standing there in ruins. Uh, and that's, these are the places that we visited uh, um, often. And they held this fascination for us. I remember uh, uh, developing prints. Uh, in, in a little dark room that, uh, that I made out of a bathroom in my parents' apartment. So I put my, my little uh, enlarger. And so, and I remember uh, how first I was fascinated, uh, and then I would uh, 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 expose the print and put it in the, in the developer. And it took a while for, for, for the image, which is black and white, of course. And so there was all this kind of a, uh, shadows started growing on the print. It was really fascinating. And then you wait, and then there is, you have to snatch it right out of the tray before it becomes too dark. So kind of a trying to find the moment of perfect clarity, and then you stick it in the fixer, so just to kind of keep that moment. So, so that realization of the presence of Christ in our life was very much like that print that was developing. And at first it was all vague, just kind of a rough shadows, shapes, and then it became clearer and clearer and clearer. It was fascinating. Uh, to the point that we discovered that, that you can see his face behind the faces of all those people that were loved. You can see his face through action, uh, through history, through uh, uh, images, and finally, uh, for for us, you know, in a kind of a unique way, uh, uh, his face became visible to us uh, through uh, iconography, through Christian art. So, uh, but uh, we realized then that. Uh, the, there's only one way in which you can describe um, uh, I'm not even sure what term to use describe God 
um, uh, uh, only through in the context of that encounter with the living person of Christ. And of course, he's not there by himself. He's always with, together with, uh, and uh, 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 reveals himself, re himself through the presence of other. So it's really uh, a very complex space of encounter. And, and that's basically what the icon is. It's not an image of how God is by himself, God did it. Uh, it, it is not what we think about him, either, but it is uh, a visual image of the encounter uh, uh, of every person, uh, myself as an iconographer, uh, all those uh, uh, iconographers of the past whose work I have seen and absorbed and, and use as model, uh, and basically this entire universe that, that is nothing more than or less than a place of interpersonal encounter. And it's a fascinating uh, uh, realization. So for us to realize that we call ourselves uh, believers, Christians, Orthodox Christians, <laughs> uh, is uh, uh, a result of that discovery that our life and everything that we see, everything that we hear, know, perceive, is a place of encounter uh, with with uh, a personal encounter with God, with other people. You're good. That's it. So now let's go to the floor. Bring it down. Yeah. Yeah, I'm holding it. So, is it possible to find the moment when his image is absolutely clear? No. <laughs> I don't think that it takes more than one life. But, as an iconographer, this is what you are striving for. And that's why um, the process of making an icon uh, is complex, and, uh, and each stage strives to bring that image of that encounter into a perfect focus so until it's really sharp then you discover that it's not sharp enough and then you have to make another one but but it's never never uh, uh, in fact it's never really complete uh, no uh, icon uh, is uh, as absolutely perfectly self-contained image it's only a fragment and I would even dare to say then that uh, our lives uh, are, uh, can be viewed in the same way. None of us are complete. Even when we live for, you know, 93 years, like my beloved grandmother, you know, 93 years, is our life was complete at the moment of her death? No, because she still continues on in me. And so her image is still in the process of development. So we are all striving to the moment when we can say, well, this is a perfect clarity in which that image is developed completely. And maybe it will never happen. Well, I, mean, well, I believe it will. But it will be still in dynamic of life. So the clarity, no, oh, I don't know, it's a kind of a silly image. But, you know, I love... Uh, because my eyesight is so bad that I, I uh, once a year I give myself a gift. I go and get my eyes examined, examined, and then I will get a new uh, set of eyeglasses. 
and because I, I work so much and I scratch them, although I try not to, but uh, so when I get the new pair of eyeglasses, I put them on, and the world is full of detail. It's just, it comes out in the fantastic sharpness. It gets, gets kind of a, uh, out of focus again after a while, but, but that sharpness, and, but it all move, it's moving. It's moving, it's developing, it's, and, and it's rich. But it's not limited to that point, and that's where the analogy with the print ends. But you still have that development until the point of clarity. And then that clarity can continue on forever.